Today uh, we're just going to talk about uh, the clinical efficacy of uh, pulmonary AV malformation embolization. Um, so just to uh, uh, just to start here, um, so I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background as far as uh, uh, what life is like at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, we are a uh, we're, we're a group of uh, 17 uh, interventional radiology uh, physicians. Uh, this is a, an image of our uh, main campus uh, facility or a portion of the front of the, the main campus facility. Um, uh, currently uh, in, in, the, in the Cleveland branch, uh, there are nine hospitals in our, uh, in, in our group. Uh, we cover all nine hospitals, um, which makes for uh, certainly a busy uh, practice with uh, lots of interesting cases, a nice uh, diverse uh, case mix. Um, so just some, some quick facts about the clinic. Um, we are we're a not-for-profit institution. It is a group practice with physician leadership. Uh, we have a little over 4,000 uh, professional staff now, and um, we, we, we see quite a few uh, hospital admissions every year. So uh, we also have uh, facilities uh, down in Florida, um, the Lou Ruvo uh, Center for Brain Health in, uh, in Las Vegas. Um, facility in Canada, Abu Dhabi, and uh, uh, soon uh, uh, London in just a few years. Okay, so just looking at some of our numbers as far as uh, overall uh, cases here at the Cleveland Clinic, um, we do uh, somewhere around uh, uh, peripheral visceral, visceral aneurysms, somewhere around 50 to 70 cases a year. Um, you know, those are uh, typically the renal, uh, renal aneurysms, uh, splenic aneurysms. Um, a little bit, a little bit more. I think uh, you know, as we as we're closing out uh, 2018 right now, um, the numbers are uh, looking around uh, 74 for the for for 2018. Um, Pre-Y90 embolization. Um, this is something that I think as a group, uh, there's of, of the 17 of us, there's uh, seven of us that uh, are typically doing the uh, uh, the Y90 um, procedures. Um, we uh, pretty much have moved away from uh, doing many um, embolizations, uh, specifically of GDAs. Um, we do uh, uh, you know, still find ourselves embolizing uh, left, uh, uh, excuse me, right gastrics and uh, you know, some, some anomalous uh, vessels um, from time to time. But uh, certainly the, the number of uh, GDAs that we've embolized has gone down pretty, pretty significantly. Um, here's just a picture of that. Uh, and GI bleeds. We we actually do quite a few uh, embolizations for uh, GI bleeding cases. Um, that uh, is, we're we're a little bit above, a uh, little north of uh, 200 cases for the year. Um, it's it's I mean, they they typically come in fits and starts, but it's uh, yeah, I think uh, this this year, um, looking at the stats, uh, just about two weeks ago, we were we were right around 211. <clears throat> And um, PAVM cases, uh, we, we serve as a, 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 a HHT center of excellence here in the, at, at the clinic. Um, we, we have been averaging a, a little bit more year over year. We typically do about a four to five a month. Um, and uh, that, that, that kind of puts us right around uh, plus minus 50 cases for the year. And uh, there's a whole host of particle-based cases. Uh, the great majority of these typically are uh, um, our drug drug eluting bead cases, which I didn't include all of those, um, but because uh, uh, some of our uh, partners use uh, uh, C taste, and uh, but when you when you start looking at all of our uh, uh, particle based cases, uh, this year we're actually around uh, 263 um, particle cases are bronchial artery embolization, the uterine fibroid embolization. And here's just another one of our PABM cases right there. Um, so uh, the things that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start the discussion by talking about, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, a little bit about the background about HHT, PABMs, and basics. Then we'll kind of proceed in kind of uh, just looking at, uh, you know, why, why it's such a, such a great, uh, great area. It's, it's, it's a personal passion of mine. Um, we'll, we'll discuss some, uh, some recent uh, studies. Um, a little bit of a discussion on some of the uh, different technologies that are available, and uh, then from there we'll kind of get into a little bit about the Turuma hydrogel technology, um, some neuro and peripheral treatments, 
and uh, the, the grade study. Um, and that's, uh, that, that'll, that'll be the, the great majority of uh, the discussion. There we go. Okay. So uh, for pulmonary AVMs, um, that's uh, the, the portion of HHT that I, I, I typically um, engage with uh, our, our patients on. And um, when they followed the patient up uh, via MRA uh, 28 months later, you don't see any uh, recanalization in that. It was uh, the really nice kind of dense coil pack right there. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole host of technologies out there. Um, you have your uh, bare platinum coils. As I mentioned, we have pushable coils. Uh, fibered coils um, with a whole host of different uh, fiber technologies, hydrogel coils as well as uh, hydrogel uh, coils, not just with hydrogel on the outside, but uh, the uh, CX platform, which uh, also has hydrogel um, within uh, the inner portion of the coil uh, to kind of allow for a softer uh, uh, coil with a, with a denser coil pack. Um, you know, I think that the, the, um, the, the decision for what coil to use I think uh, the most important thing is, is uh, you know, what can you use uh, most comfortably, most reliably that's going to uh, allow you to achieve the outcome that you're looking for. Um, you know, I, I think that those are the uh, kind of the paramount uh, factors when, when you're choosing um, one coil over the other. Um, you know, one of the things that I found kind of compelling about the Shimahira study that we're presenting, as well as, um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, you know, I, I tend to use uh, you know, quite a few of the uh, uh, the Azure coils, both the um, the hydrogel on the outside, uh, the Azure standard Azure coil uh, platform, as well as the CX platform, because um, you can use them sometimes in different ways. Um, your your Azures uh, with the hydrogel on the outside tend to be a little bit um, uh, stiffer and can either function as a really nice backstop where you can kind of put that coil in there and then use your CXs um, to kind of fill in, or even vice versa, where you can uh, deploy a CX uh, to kind of uh, get a nice kind of compact uh, coil mass and then kind of follow it up with a, uh, with a um, standard Azure coil to, uh, you know, kind of give you all the benefits of the endothelialization. And then obviously, um, you know, we use uh, at, at the clinic, uh, given the number of embolizations that we do, we do use uh, quite a few um, uh, pushable coils and plugs as well. Um, you know, some of the, I think some of the things that you should be aware of with uh, plugs, you also need to always uh, look at like your landing zone. Um, the plug technologies I think are great, but depending on the length of uh, uh, artery that you have when you're embolizing, it's always important to, um, to keep an eye on and make sure that, uh, you know, as, 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 you know, with the phasicity of the respiratory cycle, and or the complexity of the arteries that you're in, that coil itself may uh, it may be a little bit, um, uh, or the, the plug itself, excuse me, may just be a little bit challenging to deploy if you don't have a straight landing zone. The proximal most portion of the plug to kind of uh, provide that uh, level of occlusion to make sure that we weren't going to get any, uh, any more filling there. And um, you know, that's really kind of, you know, some of the things that you should be kind of thinking of, you know, pretty much uh, from the moment that you see one of these cases. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, when I approach a PAVM case, the great majority of the, of the decisions uh, for what products to use are uh, pretty much made, um, you know, based on the pre-procedural CT, um, CTA. Um, you know, I'll be able to kind of get a rough estimate of uh, the size of the uh, coils that I would need uh, the number of coils that I would need if I could use plugs, um, you know, what what kind of shape the patient's going to be in, uh, whether or not they can actually tolerate, um, you know, the procedure lying flat if, like, let's say that they have some underlying other issue, whether it's something as uh, simple as morbid obesity or if it's uh, something a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more challenging, like there are some other either cardiac or cardiopulmonary um, uh, past medical history uh, 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 issues that you're going to contend with. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, even I, I even tell, uh, you know, my, my uh, trainees who, who we work with, you know, sometimes it, it's nice to use your, uh, your um, 
detachable coils just because it does provide a greater degree of um, a greater degree of reliability or safety when you are deploying these coils in, in such areas. Um, you know, it's great if you can kind of deploy the coil, um, you know, either entirely or near entirely, and just kind of like let it sit and make sure it's not going to move as the patient breathes. Um, and when you can see that, you have a great, greater degree of comfort deploying that coil and, or plug and then moving to the next one. And, you know, sometimes it is important to you know, kind of think of, you know, think about, you know, kind of your platinum versus your fiber versus your bare as to, you know, kind of what are some of the other things to think about. You know, I do think compaction is a, uh, is a real um, phenomenon. Um, there have been uh, a whole host of different studies that have kind of uh, borne that out, uh, some in the neurospace, some in the peripheral space. So, um, you know, kind of having a, a reasonable coil pack there that uh, you can rely on, I think, is incredibly important. I just kind of wanted to kind of summarize kind of some of the things or why I use uh, the, the Azure technology. Uh, typically, it's, uh, it, the detachment's reliable. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great coil to, uh, yeah, to be kind of used with, with uh, my trainees at times. Um, you know, I've had them, uh, you know, kind of take coils in and out of a catheter. And, you know, when, when they're doing that sometimes, um, you know, try as you might to kind of keep an eye on, um, you know, their, their hands as well as on the, on the screen, you know, you can, you can see how uh, it, it, it works, you know, in, in, in the hands of different people. And, um, you know, it, I can happily say that, uh, you know, it is a very um, reliable, consistent attachment mechanism. Um, and I don't have to worry about uh, the premature deployment of the coil. Um, Long-term occlusion, um, you know, I can't say that I've, uh, you know, in, in my patient population, I've had um, any of my uh, patients in whom I've used the uh, hydrogel coils. Um, I, I can't say that they have... Uh, uh, come back uh, with with issues secondary to recanalization, um, and uh, you know especially using that Azure CX coil um, uh, um, the product, it does make for an extremely dense coil um, uh, coil pack, um, which is which is something that um, is uh, really you know is, is really remarkable about the catheter, as well as the fact that we have a um, you, you're going to get a nice high radial force. So the coil is not going to move on. Another question right here: uh, Have you had to recapture a coil after partially deploying? Is swelling a, a hinder? Um, no, I actually haven't found that to be a, the case. Um, you know, typically when I do these AV malformation embolizations, I'm using uh, 2.4, um, occasionally 2.1, um, many times or even 2.7 French uh, microcatheters, um, and uh, you know, getting getting the coils kind of in and out. Um, hasn't hasn't been too much of an issue. Um, usually, uh, you know, kind of partially deploying it like that. Um, you know, the swelling uh, typically it really doesn't uh, typically occur until later. Um, you know, truth be told, I did actually have a little bit of difficulty pulling a coil back in once. Um, I was using it was a it was actually a, a visceral aneurysm. I was calling coiling. I had a, uh, a two, uh, two French uh, neuro microcatheter, and um, kind of getting the coil back through that was a little bit, a little bit difficult. Um, but uh, you know, typically, uh, to answer your question, um, I haven't had an issue with, uh, with, with, with swelling of the coil. I hope that helps. Thank you very much for your time.